office, it is a hearing to consider recommendations regarding an update on the coronavirus disease 2019 COVID-19. Thank you. And Dr. Del Reynoso. Good afternoon, Chair Hartman and members of the board. I'd like to begin our COVID update with information from our dashboard. Madam Clerk, may I have my first slide? As of January 10th, new cases, we stand at 630. Uh, we are reporting uh, one new death. The death is an individual um, of 70 plus years of age with no underlying medical conditions. Uh, the death was not associated with a congregate care site. And this individual resided in the city of Santa Maria. Uh, we are also noting 6,513 active cases. Um, of that, 87 hospitalized. Uh, total cases stand at 58,847 with total deaths at uh, 572. Our current case rate per 100,000 is uh, 187.78. And testing positivity is 26.6. And um, I would like to note that over the last three days, there were uh, 3,122 cases reported to the public health department. Uh, Saturday, um, we had uh, 1,325, which is a new record for reported daily cases. On Sunday, we reported um, uh, 1,167, and then yesterday, uh, the 630. So these are all new records for Santa Barbara County, positivity rate, case rate, um, and active cases reported. Next. Um, and, and we are uh, uh, hypothesizing that much of these uh, records uh, uh, could be due to the Omicron uh, uh, variant. Uh, the sequencing reports from CDPH uh, for the last week of December, from December 23rd to the 29th, indicated that 79% uh, of the samples were due to Omicron. Uh, we, uh, we believe that the current levels uh, are much higher. Uh, CDC projected that Omicron stands at about 95% in Region 9, which includes Arizona, California, Hawaii, Nevada, and, and uh, four or five uh, Pacific Islands. Uh, and, and we believe that uh, because of the uh, Omicron uh, variant in our community, it may account for steep increases that we're seeing as well as our neighbors are seeing. Next. Uh, this uh, graph describes the Santa Barbara County case rate as of 1-6. Um, in the last two weeks from uh, December 23rd to January 6th, the case rate has increased drastically um, at about uh, 405%. Uh, we are noting uh, that the alpha surge peaked um, at 99.4 uh, last January, um, and the delta surge peaked at 31.2 uh, earlier, uh, or late, I should say, in the summer um, in August. So the current Omicron surge, um, the trend is upwards, um, and again, at the case rate of 187.8. Next. And uh, this graph describes the case rate by vaccination status as of December 28th. Um, so overall, county, uh, countywide case rate uh, increase of 446%. So going from a 15.7 to 85.8. 
But if we drill down, we can see that uh, case rate among unvaccinated increased um, about 301%. Um, and the case rate among vaccinated increased very significantly among the uh, about 792%. Uh, but if we look at the difference in case rate between the unvaccinated and the vaccinated, it's about a 2.7 fold which means that in our community, people who are unvaccinated are about 2.7 times more likely to get COVID-19 uh, than vaccinated individuals. Next. Uh, regarding hospital capacity, we are seeing hospitalization at the cusp at 64.5%, uh, um, almost to the red zone. And then with regards to ICU, fortunately, we are seeing, uh, we are seeing some uh, ups and downs, but at 60.5%. Uh, Next. Um, this is an interesting uh, graph just to show uh, your board the, uh, the surge and its impact on hospitalization rates. Um, so we see that with the uh, first surge um, in, uh, um, on July, 20, uh, July 29th of 2020, we saw a, a high of 89 cases with a ICU being at 31. And then with the second surge, we see that um, the height was at 211 hospitalization and of that the uh, 60 uh, in the ICU. And with the Delta surge, which is the third surge late last summer, we saw a height of 82 hospitalization with 24 ICU. And currently with the Omicron, we're seeing um, 87 uh, individuals hospitalized and of that the 10 in ICU. Um, I also like to note that hospitalized cases have um, dramatically gone up over the weekend as well. Um, we're seeing an increase of about 50% in COVID admissions from a week ago. And again, uh, fortunately, we're not seeing this dramatic increase in ICU admissions, um, averaging between uh, six to 10 cases. Um, and currently we do have one pediatric hospitalization, but not in ICU. Next. With regards to vaccination rates, we have 77.3% of eligible Santa Barbara individuals vaccinated, and we have 69.3% percent of eligible Santa Barbara County fully vaccinated. Uh, public health continues to offer mobile vaccination clinics throughout the county in various locations. Uh, our calendar for the mobile vaccination clinic uh, clinics um, is on our website at publichealthsbc.org uh, for detailed information on the dates and lo locations. Um, in addition to this, uh, we started um, uh, another vaccination effort in IV and tomorrow at Goleta Valley Community Center. And this will run through January and the appointments are available in my turn. Next. Uh, this graph or chart uh, describes the different zip codes in our uh, county and the vaccination rates um, among those zip codes. So we, we continue to worry about zip codes that are in the red, like 93117 uh, and uh, 93254. We continue to work with those who are at the zip codes in the red and the orange, uh, working with our community partners for outreach. And our uh, this is the uh, priority for our mobile vaccination clinic, being in those communities um, in various locations with various partners so that uh, we can increase the vaccination coverage in these zip codes. Next. Um, current outbreaks as of yesterday, we are currently, our team, our outbreak team is managing uh, 91 outbreaks. Uh, 26 are among businesses, 11 are in schools, and 54 are in various types of congregate living facilities. 
next. Um, but I'd like to uh, introduce some forecasting uh, slides to your board. Uh, the next three slides are forecasts from CDPH. Uh, we are sharing these forecasts with your board since we've been asked to predict what the next few months will look like given the Omicron surge. I do want to caution your board that these are at best rough predictions. Um, and given the uh, changing landscape of the pandemic, uh, we want to say based upon what we know locally, they may be very rough predictions, uh, but will give us some indication for planning. Uh, these short-term forecasts take into account the most recent trends in cases, hospitalization, ICU, patients, and deaths and um, apply statistical models to that data to generate the anticipated trends for the next four to uh, two to four weeks. Uh, with the volume and pace of COVID-19 data generation, um, the models or the uh, ensemble predictions, um, uh, these estimates may contain unexpected results, may not, uh, uh, may not, we may not see uh, the predictions come true. We may see higher numbers in some cases, or we may see lower numbers in others. Um, also, emerging details about Omicron variant may increase the uncertainty of these forecasts. Um, I want to explain that the ensemble forecast, the solid blue line, takes the median of the forecasts available um, on any given date and fits them all um, into a smooth line uh, so that we can see a nice clean line for the trending. Uh, so for Santa Barbara County, Using 94 as the actual hospitalization for January 10th, the ensemble forecast for hospitalization through February 10th is 1,043, or an increase of 949 hospital, hospital admits. Um, again, based upon our um, real life experience, uh, we see we may we are seeing that this may be a very worst case scenario. Um, that reality may look different. Um, the factors that can impact this forecast really is a decrease in case rates, increase in vaccination, and changes in community uh, behaviors. Next. Uh, for ICU, uh, the forecast is based on 46 actual daily ICU patients as of January 10th. Uh, the ensemble projection is for 786 daily total through February 10th. Um, this projection is also a steep increase. And when we look at uh, similar projections um, uh, throughout the state, we're noting that very similar trends are uh, indicated for Ventura and SLO. Next. Uh, lastly, this is quite a somber projection about death uh, based on 578 total deaths as of January 10th. The projected 30 day forecast through February 1 is a total of 781 deaths, which is an increase about, uh, well, an increase of 203 deaths or 35% increase. Um, again, I just want to caution that these are only forecasts that our sense um, and our sense is that um, the forecasts project the worst case scenarios based on our case trends uh, our, and, and hospitalization trends. Uh, but these forecasts can assist us in planning our response efforts. Next. Um, I'd like to update your board on our current testing efforts. This table represents testing for public health managed testing sites only. Um, and that like uh, additional testing capacity is available through pharmacies, uh, healthcare providers, independent testing sites, and school employer-based testing. Um, and, and also noted that county managed testing sites, we frequently can operate beyond the scheduled testing capacity uh, by providing testing to walk-ins. So we have um, the, through the, for the last three weeks or so, we have um, 
noted a higher demand uh, for testing uh, opportunities. So we have expanded our Santa Maria Fair Park. Um, beginning uh, next week, we will add an extra day. So currently, uh, Santa Maria is running Sunday through Thursday, 12-hour uh, days. And beginning uh, next Friday, it will be going toward, it will be adding uh, Friday appointments. Um, so essentially uh, an additional uh, 528 uh, testing spots a day. Uh, we have a direct minibus at direct relief and we moved to 12 hour operations um, yesterday. And uh, so we are there now from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, and that site delivers 264 uh, tests a day. In our uh, anchored by our uh, Longpoke uh, Healthcare Center, we are opened 8:30 to 4:30, um, so we can uh, we prioritize essential workers and can complete 84 tests a day, and we've added extra appointments um, as the need arise. Um, our Santa Barbara Healthcare Center. Um, we also have expanded hours, and it our uh, trusting our testing trailer is open Wednesday through Sunday, seven thirty to six thirty p.m. And uh, we've added these extra appointments through the end of the month. Um, most exciting, uh, we just heard hot off, hot off the press. Um, the state did approve our request submitted two weeks ago for an additional site. Um, we are in negotiation uh, with uh, the facility. It will be located um, in Goleta slash Santa Barbara. It will be open 12 hour days, six days a week. And we anticipate that they will be able to deliver 196 tests a day. And uh, we estimate that uh, we will be up and running in uh, two weeks. Um, Appointment no-shows continues to be a problem um, at all of our sites. So we have individuals booking appointments and they're not showing up. So that really impacts our community's access uh, to appointments. So we uh, strongly encourage individuals with appointments at any of our sites to please cancel if you're not planning to um, take that opportunity to test so other community members can um, seize the opportunity. Uh, current turnaround time for results is anywhere from 24 to 36 hours for all sites, and this is based upon the increased demand um, all through the state. Next. Um, I'd also like to update your board on our efforts to secure at-home antigen tests uh, to distribute uh, for our county. Our uh, five public health care centers ordered 80,000 test kits um, through our federal partner, HRSA. Uh, we are anticipating the arrival of these 80,000 kits uh, early next week. We uh, will be submitting a request again today. So these are um, to be delivered uh, to our county on a weekly basis. Um, the first week of distribute the first week of distribution, which is anywhere later this week or early next week, will be based at our five healthcare centers and our partner homeless shelters. Uh, we do have plans um, in place to engage CBOs and cities as distribution partners for the subsequent weeks. Next. Chair Hartman and members of the board, just um, so Dr. Del Renoso is aware, we have a little delay here on our end. So um, I believe we see the next page. It's just a little frozen in Zoom. My, my apologies. Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to I'd like to uh, cover the um, the new uh, guidance from the state on the isolation and quarantine for the general public. So essentially there are three uh, buckets. Uh, for individuals who test positive for COVID-19, they must um, isolate. This includes everyone, regardless of vaccination status, 
regardless of previous infection or lack of symptoms. So the recommended action includes staying at home for at least five days. Uh, isolation can end after five day five if symptoms are not present or resolving and a diagnostic test is collected on day five um, or later and you the results are negative. Um, if the individual is unable to test or chooses not to test and symptoms are not present or resolving, isolation can end after day 10. So um, you need a test on day five, be asymptomatic to exit isolation. Um, and we are uh, recommending the antigen tests um, essentially because of the quicker turnaround time. Um, after the individual exits the uh, uh, isolation, they still need to wear a well-fitted mask around others for the total of the 10 days, um, and especially in indoor setting. Next. Uh, for individuals who are exposed to someone with COVID-19, um, they need to quarantine if they are unvaccinated or if they are vaccinated and booster eligible, but have not yet received their booster dose. Uh, the recommended action is to stay home for at least five days after the last contact with the individual that has COVID-19, then test on day five. Quarantine can end after day five if symptoms are not present and the um, antigen test collected on day five or later is negative. And if there is an inability to test um, and symptoms are not present, then quarantine can end after day 10. Um, and again, masking is key. Um, so individuals will need to still wear a well-fitted mask around others for a total of 10 days. And again, especially in indoor settings. We do strongly encourage everyone to get vaccinated or boosted. Um, if testing positive at any point, follow the isolation recommendation um, that we've just shared. Next. Lastly, for individuals who are exposed to someone with COVID-19, they do not need to quarantine if they are boosted or if they are vaccinated, but are not yet eligible to be boosted. Um, but the recommended action still is to test on day five, wear a well-fitted mask around others for 10 days, especially in indoor settings. And if testing positive, follow the isolation recommendations that I've just shared. And um, if symptoms develop, test and stay home. Next. Um, lastly, I'd like to share with your board that because of Omicron, we will uh, be uh, pushing this communication piece um, to our community. We need to upgrade our mask. Um, it used to be that uh, we were wearing cloth masks, but because of the Omicron, uh, we, have, uh, we have a new standard uh, and we need to upgrade. Uh, what's good is to wear a surgical mask. This is effective. What's even more effective and better is to double mask with a surgical mask um, plus a cloth or wear a fitted uh, surgical mask. Um, the most effective and the best scenario is to wear an N95, a KN95, a KF94. And uh, um, note that the masks should not have a valve. Um, and um, the, the all masks should fit snugly, tightly, uh, covering um, your mouth and nose and consistently worn um, appropriately. Um, that ends my briefing. Dr. Ansork and I are available for any questions. Okay, uh, board members, questions? Supervisor Nelson. You have a question about hospitalizations. That's people in the hospital who test positive for COVID, correct? 
Yes, they may enter the hospital because of COVID-19, or they may have entered for another procedure and is tested and they are positive. So it includes both. Thank you. Supervisor Lavanino. Thank you, Madam Chair. On the, on the death number of 572, you know, hearing some things that were a little um, different than what I had thought originally from the CDC, just in some latest things. Do we track on that 572 how many of those had comorbidities? And, and of those comorbidities, do we track if the patient had two or three or four or five comorbidities, or do we just list it as a death? Uh, we uh, used to collect that data from hospitalized individuals, but um, I am not sure that we have that data available um, and we are collecting or reporting that data. Uh, Dr. Ansor, do you recall? Um, yes, what we do is we count deaths uh, per death certificate. So the um, attending physician at the hospital or the primary care physician at home or the coroner for that matter um, will issue a death certificate and um, we go by the death certificate. If there is any question, if the patient died from COVID or if the death was caused by one of the underlying conditions, um, I usually get consulted and uh, review the uh, medical rec record of the deceased uh, at length and in detail and come uh, to a conclusion whether uh, COVID was indeed the cause of death or not. Okay. <clears throat> I think that would be good information to have. Um, so it's interesting when you travel now, and I did spend some time out of the state, and depending on where you travel to, um, different states have different guidelines. I'm curious if, you know, when we look at our numbers, how significant the increases are in hospitalizations and death and sickness, you know, are we significant, are we doing significantly better than, for example, I just traveled to Arizona where you wouldn't even know that there was, um, you wouldn't even know there was a pandemic going on. I mean, nobody's wearing a mask, everybody's congregating. Um, there's really no social distancing of any type of anything. And I'm just curious at this point if, I know there's different ways to, there's strategies to do different things, but is one significantly better than the other? Are they experiencing explosive hospitalizations and death more so than we are, or is it just a different manner of addressing it? Uh, that's a great question, uh, uh, Supervisor Levignino, and through the chair. Um, we do have that information um, on a weekly basis. CDPH shares with us um, how California is doing in comparison with um, uh, states that are known to have uh, different policies uh, than California. Um, and there is there, there's remarkable difference in, in uh, notably in death. Um, I'm not recalling uh, hospitalization, but definitely in death. And we are more than happy to bring that back, uh, comparison of state data, um, uh, if you'd like. I think it would be helpful just just to, you know, um, I, you know, I think there's definitely, especially with now with Omicron and another turn up of, you know, we're, we're really getting, we're almost at the two year point now. I think we're a couple of months away from two years. And, you know, when we look at these forecasts, which um, as you stated, possibly worst case scenario, but they're still, um, you know, we're still putting that information out to the public. Um, I just wanna make sure that, that we're looking at um, you know, it's, it's really hard to face people when there's no end game in sight. And I, I know it's hard for you as well. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any, we just went through, <laughs> was it 15 slides, 17, almost 20 slides. Is there any positive news that you would like to 
drop on us at all. Um, the fact that we were able to uh, to order 80,000 tests on a weekly basis to flood our community, um, I think is a piece of good strategy um, in managing our COVID response. Uh, the fact that we are responsive in expanding other testing sites um, as well um, is another good piece of news. Okay, and then just my last question is, um, I know the CDC, I've seen in some press conferences, has discussed um, the possibility of at least they're having an internal dialogue about whether or not to start looking at a strategy of living with COVID as opposed to trying to squash COVID. And I'm wondering if CDPH is also having those conversations, and if so, if Santa Barbara County is also part of that. Um, kind of looking at this as this is something we're going to be living with, and we got to figure out a way to live with it that doesn't really impact our, our lives the way it is right now. We started the conversation about uh, how to uh, exit the pandemic, especially when uh, the uh, uh, when it becomes endemic. Uh, I believe that that conversation uh, started and then got sidelined by Omicron. So we're back to um, scrambling in our response efforts. But it is on the table, and uh, CDPH does uh, cover it. Uh, but very briefly, lately, because of the surge in cases. Well, so this is from somebody who obviously has no medical background or anything, but I'm, I'm just as this is something I hear out in the community a lot and just talking to my friends. Help me explain to them how um, Omicron is not going to get us to that end game quicker because it feels like if you have a, a virus that is spreading. I mean, as rapidly as this one does with, it seems like a lower um, hospitalization rate or at least a, a, a lower death rate than what we've experienced. Isn't this in some sort of a backwards blessing that, you know, everybody's going to get exposed to it. We're going to get to the end stage quicker or is that, or what's wrong with that, that thought process? I could chime in, um, Supervisor Lavanini, uh, through the chair. Um, that is, of course, what we are looking at and discussing. Now, the fastest path to get to living with COVID is not necessarily the best path. Uh, our concern right now is that um, even though, and that is maybe, a, that is definitely a good thing that most people who get Omicron, the Omicron version, do not end up in the hospital, that the percentage of people who end up in the hospital is much, 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 much lower. Uh, you, you will remember that I've always touted that of, uh, you know, 10% of, of new infections end up in the hospital, another 10% of those end up in the ICU. That is no longer the case. That is by a factor of 10, probably less. But if you just... Um, have a small percentage of infected people ending up in the hospital, if you multiply this small percentage by a really large number of infections, then you still come up with a scenario where our hospitals will be strained. And not just in order to take care of COVID, but also in order to take care of other diseases. And also um, we are seeing uh, a huge number of absentee uh, absenteeism uh, with staff uh, across all sectors, and that is that is very uh, limiting and um, very unfortunate. Um, so maybe I'm I'm digressing a little bit, but no, I understand what you're um, saying. I, I understand what you're saying, and I think we all all get that that to get to that peak, you're going to have to burn through. Um, a lot of disease, and you're going to have people that unfortunately have um, a reaction to that that is, um, you know, it's heartbreaking. But, and one of the things that I kind of noticed that on all these forecasts, they all ended at the, the maximum. And it was, uh, I'm curious if, if anybody's looked at, you know, uh, what, what is the, uh, so if let's say it maxes out on February 6th, like we're kind of talking about, if we, if we took those charts and I know that they're rough estimates, but let's say we followed that. 
how does that stay at a peak for weeks or months, or does it is there a, just as quick uh, downturn after that? Would you expect? Probably, yeah, exactly. That's what we're expecting. Uh, uh, when we look at what happened in South Africa and also in other areas um, where where they peaked already, they're seeing a very very rapid down downwards trend in cases. So. Yeah, this is a very different um, wave of COVID because it goes up so extremely rapidly and then falls precipitously after peaking. So that's what we are looking at. And um, uh, to use your, your term, yes, uh, the disease will burn through the population at a very rapid pace and will therefore um, help in the end by uh, creating immunity and by uh, hopefully uh, protecting the, uh, the vast majority of people um, of future coronaviruses. Thank you. Supervisor Williams. Well, you know, I do think that the, the less um, severity of Omicron is good news. I think the problem is even if you have a, a factor of 10 less deaths, if we end up having 1,200 active cases instead of 600, right, which that's where we seem to be headed, you're still going to have twice as many more people die even with, with a factor of 10 less um, uh, severity. So, uh, you know, to me, the, 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 the question is do you take seriously the possibility that our number of hospitalization, hospitalization will go up or not. And it's a difficult call because every time we've had one of these peaks, you kind of, you need preparation beforehand to take the hospitalization seriously. It, they're, they're the, the number hospitalized, the number in ICU, and then the number die that die are also all successive waves mm -hmm after the number of new cases peaks. And so you, we kind of need to make a decision of whether or not to take it seriously beforehand, right? And so I'm interested in, even if that these projections are off by 50%, that's a massive number of people that would need to be in the hospital. What kind of preparations are taking place for that possibility? Um, so I'm, that's what I'm inter in, interested in. And that's a question for Dr. Don Reynoso or Ansorg? That's right. Um, the the uh, part, of, part of the preparation is, again, making sure that our community has access to both PCR and antigen testing. And we are, uh, we've begun that preparation two or three weeks ago. The other part of that preparation is to continue um, our efforts with vaccination. Not only are we continuing with uh, mobile vaccination clinics, but we're also doing pop-up uh, vaccination clinics in Goleta, in, in Isla Vista. And I think the third piece would be to reconvene our hospital partners to have conversations about um, hospital admissions, to talk about um, uh, uh, strategies that can protect the hospital um, environment as well. But I do want to note that um, I think oftentimes when we have conversations about Omicron, um, it becomes somewhat of a binary conversation that Omicron is mild, or if you don't have mild symptoms, you end up with in the hospital with severe outcomes. I think that there's a, the third element that um, often is not discussed is the uh, individuals who suffer uh, with long-term uh, 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 symptoms, who is not severe enough to be hospitalized, but they suffer from a, a host of ailments. And data is emerging that um, that, that is a real worry. So I would um, I want to say that uh, that uh, mild may not necessarily mean that you won't feel. Um, um, discomfort that you won't be ill um, or you won't have long-term effects because you may. And so again, it goes back to testing, vaccination, isolation and quarantine and working with our community partners to uh, promote and, and ensure um, access to all of those. Supervisor Hart. Yeah, I, I think that um, 
the death projections and hospitalization projections are you know, really tough to see um, and scary for everybody. And we're all hoping that you know, by people taking actions and being careful, we can um, eliminate that and, and reduce that dramatically. And I think it is, it feels a bit out of control to, every, to all of us and to, you know, I think the general public, but um, taking action makes a difference and, and the numbers are startling. You know, when Supervisor Lavanino asked the question about other states, I thought, that's really a great question. And I just Googled it. And so um, there's big differences between California, Florida, and Arizona. California has almost 40 million people and 77,000 deaths, that's a lot. Um, but Florida has half as many people, 21 million people, and 63,000 deaths. So it has almost as many deaths with half the population as California. Arizona is even worse. Arizona has 7 million people, but 25,000 deaths. Um, and then what's really startling, and I heard this on the news this morning, and it just made me really pause, is if you look at Asia and Oceania, um, the countries in New Zealand, Australia, almost all of Asia, the numbers of deaths in relation to their populations is truly astonishing. In Australia, with a population of 25 million people, 2,500 people have died. That's all. Um, Japan, 18,000 people died with a population of 125 million people. If you look consistently, South Korea, China, Vietnam, hugely different, much, much more similar in those other Asian countries than to the United States in the death rates. And I think the reason why is, you know, those, those countries experienced the SARS outbreak and they got kind of a warning shot and they culturally adapted and then listened to public health officials and changed behaviors and it became normal to wear masks, you know, and, and take the precautions that we're asking people to do here. And, you know, nobody's talking about locking down and shutting down and stopping businesses and all of the, the things that are being spun up as uh, potential responses. We're asking people continuously, consistently to wear masks. And now we're refining that and saying, you know, let's all wear better masks. Let's wear the best mask we can get. And we can get masks now. And then let's be, let's be careful, you know, about how we relate to people and what we're doing um, about distances and things like that. So. Um, I, I just, I think it should be empowering to realize these things make a difference. And we're at a moment again, um, as Supervisor Nelson uh, pointed out this morning in his remarks, that seems eerily similar to where we were a year ago. And the answer is the same. Let's just all get vaccinated. Let's get boosted. If you, if you haven't been boosted, let's wear masks. Let's do everything we can to help each other. And we'll get through this uh, the best we possibly can. And other places have proven that it works. Supervisor Nelson. I just wanted to respond to that. Um, you know, when we look at states, we know that COVID has hit the elderly harder than it has, you know, the young. And you look at California being one of the youngest states in the, in the country versus where do most people retire in the West and the, and the East? It's Arizona and Florida. So, you know, that's the one thing about this is we're looking at numbers and we're trying to draw conclusions and it's difficult. You know, some of the numbers, you know, there's there's degrees in statistics for a reason. And a lot of us are amateur statisticians these days trying to figure these things out and draw conclusions from them. And, um, you know, I just wanted to add that to the, the conversation. And then, you know, what's gone on in Australia, while deaths have been low, has been somewhat catastrophic for personal freedoms and economic um, opportunity for the people of Australia. And so, you know, there, there's, there is gives and take here. There, there, are, there are offsetting decisions that need to be made. Um, you know, I think one of the conversations that we're, we're gonna continue to have is, you know, are these masks permanent? I mean, is this gonna be forever that we're gonna continue to be required to wear these? Or is that gonna be a personal decision that each person needs to make for themselves? And I think some point in the future, hopefully near future, I like those decisions to be made by elected representatives and not by unelected bureaucrats. And I, I understand that they are experts in certain fields, but as you've heard from Dr. Del Reynoso, you know, the only thing that she positively can find right now is that we ordered more tests. There's lots of other good news out there, but it seems for, to, from my perspective with public health officials is that it's more, it's more, it's more. This is what they do, and I understand that's what they do, but we up here are looking to push policy to impact the lives of our constituents. If we needed, if we wanted to be run by 
just um, public health officials. We could do that. It could be a different form of government. Um, but that's not the one we have here. And um, I'm anxious to get back to owning those decisions, just like our in our county with our uh, our vaccination or testing requirement. That's a policy that we made. You know, I voted against it for our, our employees, but that's something we made and we're responsible for at the end of the day. And so for me, I'm very anxious to get to that point. I find these slides on the ICU forecast, the death forecast to be reckless and irresponsible. Um, I think that these only promote panic. I think that newspapers will report on these tomorrow and people will be afraid. And I think that, that we need to get away from that. Omicron is omnipresent. We need to start rethinking about the future. Talk to people that have it. it. Seems that a lot of people that have it is very mild symptoms. I don't believe if Omicron would have been the first wave that we'd be where we are today. Um, it has been the evolution of this virus. I don't know what the next one, I don't know what Omega looks like, and that may be worse. It may be Delta with Omicron um, uh, transmissibility, and that would be really scary, absolutely. But that's not what we're dealing with today, and I think we need to start to look at these things in real, um, in reality. The reason why we're doing social distancing here is because of a health order. It's not necessarily, because um, that's what's needed to move forward. Um, so that, that's my frustration moving forward. That I think that we need to again to begin to have that conversation. Um, acknowledge Omicron for what it is. It's a mild version of COVID with far fewer health impacts um, than we've seen in the past. It is a pathway towards uh, natural immunity for many people. And um, I'm hopeful that this might be the, uh, the last wave that we continue to have these type of uh, regulations in place for. Supervisor Williams. Well, I don't think we need to look at the projections to be concerned. We should just look at the fact that we have a 40% rise in hospitalizations um, to be concerned. Um, uh, you know, it, 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 that we are charged with the responsibility of public health. We don't have to even, you know, 40% rise in hospitalizations for anything should be a cause of concern and should be a cause of preparation and action. And I don't know, you know, any freedom of mine that is being interfered with besides wearing a mask. And I'm, I'm sorry, you know, wearing a mask compared to the sacrifices of twice as many people dying is kind of a small sacrifice. Um, you know, I, I want my kids and I want the society's kids to be able to go to school. I want society to move on. But there's also basic you know, very easy uh, preparations and um, moves of, of safety, like wearing a mask, um, like getting tested, like isolating if you're positive, um, that we can engage in uh, to be responsible for uh, allowing our society to move on. Supervisor Hart. I also want to remind the board too that the impacts of this pandemic are not inequitably spread across everybody in Santa Barbara County. You know, that there, there are many, many people who are feeling this in different ways and much more intense ways. You know, we're fortunate to have jobs that allow us flexibility of being able to do a lot of our work on Zoom and many of the professional, business, um, professional people in our community you know, haven't missed a beat. Um, I mean, obviously there have been impacts on our, our lifestyle, but professionally, economically, you know, the stock market is at the highest market it's ever been. You know, unemployment is, is trending down. The economy is booming. People are, you know, going about their business. Americans are not suffering economically in, in the way that was anticipated at the beginning of the pandemic. But there are many, many people who are suffering a great deal, you know, who are on the verge of homelessness, you know, who have had job losses, who um, are feeling the weight of the inequity of our public health system in this country, who are not able to access health care the same way other people are. And so I think our policy discussion probably should be focused on that. You know, how can we address that inequity? And what should we be doing as a board to learn the lesson of the underinvestment in the public health system for the past 10, 20 years? you know, and be better prepared in the future to address that. I think that, you know, is, is in our lane. It's not the public health officer's um, jurisdiction exclusively. 
And you know, we need to figure out a way to resource those things so that the next pandemic and the ongoing pandemic is less um, impactful to people who are least capable of absorbing that. And uh, your light's still on. Yes, I, I had it. So go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chair Hartman. I just wanted to get back to that first question I asked um, Dr. Del Renoso. You know, are, are all people being tested going to the hospital? Are those, is that people that are in the hospital for COVID or people with COVID? You know, I actually called my hospital yesterday, checked in. Are hospitalizations up? Um, not, no, hospitalizations are not up. Are they up with, with COVID? Yes. And that's where they're having an issue, right? So people that are tested and they have to, deal with them differently because of the protocols. Um, staffing's also an issue, of course, because they're exposed. They send half their, their staff home and then they have to bring in another staff and people working overtime, and I get that. That's a stressor out there, but we're not seeing hospitalizations for, for COVID, is not is what I'm hearing from my, my hospital partner, the largest hospital in our county. Um, so, you know, those are the things that we need to look at the numbers. Yes, the numbers go up 40%. I, I, I hear that. That's happening in the general population. And so you apply the general population to the hospitalized, you're gonna see a 40% increase as well. And so when you're testing 100% of the people, you know, you're gonna get positive cases. And that's what we're seeing, I believe, in our hospitalization numbers. We need to look deeper into these numbers and not draw, you know, reckless conclusions um, that just scare people. I think we need to be a realist about it. I think we need to be optimistic about it while still preparing. So I think this is the conversation that's occurring in people's living rooms and over their kitchen tables because this is, we don't have all the answers. We have emerged into something that we've never experienced before. And it is, these different waves are, uh, it can be very disheartening, but we've been preparing to learn and to innovate and we do have many more tools at our disposal. And, and uh, we, we have to be optimistic going forward. I, I think about our county motto uh, to keep our community safe, healthy, and prosperous. And we've got to balance those things. And it's, it's not always an easy thing to do. Um, I, I was thinking along the same lines as Supervisor Hart, and I just thought I would add one little factum to this, and that Texas is about 35% higher than California's death rate, and they have uh, a very young population, even younger than California. So um, it, it translates into about 20,000 deaths in that one state. So it, it is a big difference, I think. Uh, especially if it's your family. Anyway, this debate will continue, uh, but I do have a few questions uh, for, for Dr. Doreno. So the first has to do with the San Ynez Valley and testing. Um, we, we really have people calling our office saying, uh, many of us are older, we can't get to Lompoc or some other place. Um, there's not testing at the, at the pharmacies. So my question to you is, um, is the testing trailer that's available in Santa Barbara, can, can that go on a day to the valley? Or um, is there some other way to get the, the at-home tests uh, to flood them in the valley uh, at a greater percentage? Because we're, we're really um, having trouble there. So what can you recommend? Sir Hartman, I definitely, we cannot move the uh, trailer or the testing trailer from direct relief for a day under contract with the state that has to stay there or leave for at least two weeks to another location. So logistically, it would be very challenging. However, given that we will be, um, we will have access to a significant number of antigen testing, um, we, we would love to work with the Santa Inez Valley partners um, to be able to supply them with at-home antigen tests for them to distribute. Good, well, thank you. So relief is coming. The, the, yes. other, the other question I have is, um, it, uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about what's happening with schools. And then um, I'd like to contrast that with what's happening with childcare, because I think we have a crisis in our county um, for testing and, and dealing with uh, childcare. So first of all, then, um, how are, uh, I know that in Santa Barbara, I think in Goleta, that the schools have contracted for testing. And, and so that's working fairly well, but could you elaborate? 
Yes, um, starting before schools came uh, back in session for the school year, our team worked with all the school districts to strongly encourage them to secure testing uh, uh, sites, whether to jump on board with the color system through the state that's a free platform. Um, so some schools uh, did do that. Some schools chose to do that in addition, uh, contract with other uh, third party vendors like um, uh, various ones I can think of. Um, and so we, our team, our school uh, team supports the school counterparts in making sure that they had access um, to pursue that. Some districts are, um, uh, did uh, a more diverse portfolio for testing opportunities than others. And so we continue to uh, support schools that have outbreaks that end up not having tests. Uh, we have uh, supplied various schools with um, antigen tests when um, during outbreak situations. But in essence, we are um, we are available should any school district want to pursue again uh, jumping on the color uh, platform or the other options of um, that their counterparts in other parts of the county are using. Okay, so um, that brings us then to child care. Um, the first question is, are there any at-home tests for, for children under two that have FDA approval? I don't believe per CDPH testing for under two is not required. Um, I'm uncertain about whether there are antigen or any testing available that's FDA approved. Um, Dr. Ansor, do you know? Yes, the antigen tests are not approved for children under two. Uh, so far, symptomatic children uh, that had to be tested, whether they have, you know, COVID or another upper respiratory virus have been tested at their pediatrician's office, which of course is fine under so-called more normal circumstances, but with this Omicron rising cases, it is not sustainable. And um, we are a little, I agree with you, we are really in a, in a uh, crisis situation with, uh, with childcare, especially the under two-year-olds. So it, it is um, very challenging, and um, we are looking into uh, one option would be, for instance, the saliva test uh, that might be easier with a toddler. Um, and um, the, the other problem is that child care is not licensed like schools. It's li licensed under the Department of Social Services, and um, they have very different um, guidelines. So um, I'm sure that we will have to um, tackle this in the very near future, and uh, we will bring this up tomorrow in our weekly CDPH meeting for sure. Well, thank you. Um, I, we're experiencing this in my office with uh, Gina Fisher, who has a young child, and she's, what is she supposed to do? Her child is sent home with mild symptoms or some other child in the class uh, has tested, is positive, and it, this affects the entire class and the families and the siblings, uh, and um, it's not really clear to get them tested and how long, you know, when, so it's very, very disruptive. And it's not just Gina in my office, I'm hearing this from parents of young children everywhere, uh, and, and they can't work, and, and so this is, uh, the more guidance, the more testing, the more support we can give to the child care uh, would, would really help the economy and everything else. Um, so I, I encourage us to have clearer messaging, but also uh, more structure for the testing because the schools have it, but the child care doesn't, and it leaves people really at sea. Um, I think that's uh, all my questions. We're almost ready to go to public comment, but I, but I am getting some texts saying that we would sure like to see some PCR testing in the Santa Inez Valley if that's at all possible. So I wanna get that on the record and hope that you can 
figure that out, Dr. Oh. Del Reynoso. But thank you um, for. We, yes, yes, Supervisor um, Hartman. So previously, when we had the testing uh, trailer, uh, if you recall the bus, and we moved it all over the county, um, the, the state um, expects us to have a certain amount of uh, testers uh, to be able to support our efforts. So um, I do understand the need for PCR testing out in uh, uh, the Santa Inez Valley and we'll work with um, the pharmacies and the uh, urgent care centers and our other healthcare providers out there to see if we can come up with something that'll work. Thank you, I really appreciate that. All right. Madam Chair, uh, I did have one sure. more question, I'm sorry. Um, uh, could Dr. Duranosa speak to the work that she is doing um, at the jail to to address the ongoing outbreak um, amongst the prison and staff population at the jail. It's been a lot of concern. We have a number of, of letters from the public um, today about that issue. Um, our team, we have a team um, stood up uh, in our department to support the jail leadership in uh, the outbreak mitigation. And we actually just met, uh, and, and we are guided by our CDPH um, experts in, in congregate uh, living situations about how to mitigate uh, that effort. So we have a uh, draft, a list of guidelines that is supported by CDPH that we will be uh, sharing with the sheriff leadership uh, uh, later uh, this afternoon. But our, um, our goal is to uh, decompress the uh, main jail, uh, support a very intentional um, and thoughtful movement of uh, transfers to the uh, North Branch Jail um, uh, in order to uh, basically end the outbreak at the jail and prevent another outbreak um, in the new uh, facility. Thank you, Dr. Dorno. So I see that we have um, Tracy McCuga, uh, the public defender on the, the Zoom call too. I wonder if she could speak to the work that, that her department is doing to um, potentially reduce the jail population, which is obviously a, a, another element of the solution to this problem. Mr. Hartman, members of the board, uh, it's a pleasure to meet here, be here today. Um, I do appreciate all the work that the Sheriff's Department is doing as well as Dr. Dana Rosa's department. We have grave concerns about the health and well-being of our clients. Um, our efforts are in to identify individuals that should be considered for early release. Um, as you know, we have a very large pretrial population, but we do in fact have sentenced individuals in our jail that could be considered for early release options, alternative release options, and our biggest tool at this point is actually using litigation methods within the court system itself to secure those releases. Um, we also have a lot of concern for the individuals in the jail that are currently suffering from mental illness um, that have now been denied movement to state hospital or movement into our PUF. Um, so for us, again, it's the litigation. It is literally working with probation, the district attorney's office, other, other individuals in the system to try to identify people to get out and to release the population. If you look at the, I think the number is approximately 126 individuals who are sentenced in our jail. Um, if you looked at those individuals and you looked at people that were nonviolent offenders, for example, which there are many, you could potentially decompress the jail by about 20% by seeking early release or reduce sentencing for those individuals. Thank you, Ms. McCougan. I know the CEO's office um, during the holiday period convened, you know, all of the public safety partners in, a, in, a, in the courts in a conversation, a collaborative conversation about ways to um, decompress the, the population at the jail and protect public safety at the same time. And, I, and I'm encouraged by that work, want to support it in any way that um, we can as a board and encourage um, everybody involved in that system to, to really think creatively about ways to end this outbreak because this is this is persistent, it's continuing. Um, you know, people don't have a choice when they're in the jail um, about their their proximity to others, and um, you know we need to really make this a high priority. And I hope 
you know, this, I know the sheriff's department is working at it, but I, I, I would hope that, that, you know, we could do more uh, quicker to resolve this. Okay, uh, seeing no more lights or um, nods, it's time to go to public comment. Madam Clerk. 